Welcome to Behind the Camera in the Eagle's Nest uh, with Judy Harrington from BirdLife, Southern New South Wales. We are about to start. I'd just like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Nell Graham, who will be, uh, uh, who's the coordinator of the Parramatta River Catchment Group and who will be managing the questions. Uh, we hope you have a lot. And uh, Judy, <laughs> President of BirdLife at Southern New South Wales. Uh, before we commence with the talk, we'll just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. We're requesting people ask questions in the Q&A function uh, or the chat if you want to, but the Q&A is best. We will monitor these questions and if we can't answer them all, we will uh, uh, write back uh, in email format. Your microphone will be muted for the entire session and the webinar may go slightly over time, hopefully not. And, uh, but it just depends because there's lots to learn about and lots to say. I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. We're on Aboriginal land and I'd like to acknowledge the elders uh, past, present and emerging. <laughs> I acknowledge that Aboriginal people have always cared for the lands around Parramatta River and continue to do so today. And we are uh, working closely with Aboriginal people in the management of the river. I, we just wanted to say that the Parramatta uh, River catchment extends from Blacktown to uh, the uh, Cockatoo Island. It covers almost uh, a million people's homes. And we are also um, pleased that it is the home of the Sea Eagle in uh, the uh, Sydney Olympic Park. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Judy Harrington. Uh, Judy's been involved with the Sea Eagle uh, a CAM project since 2009 and prior in terms of looking at the nests and seeing how um, we could understand more about the sea eagle. But I will stop talking and let uh, Judy do that. So in terms of doing that, I'll just stop sharing and Judy will uh, share her screen. Here we go. Oh, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for the kind words. And I'm very glad to be talking to you about our white-bellied sea eagles. Um, a couple of the river mascots are the powerful owl and the bar-tailed godwit, um, wonderful birds. But this is another wonderful bird, and I hope I can tell you a little bit about their lifestyle. Um, Parramatta can, River. Can I just the, interrupt? Sorry, sorry? You're, you're not, you haven't got your presentation up yet. Oh, I beg your pardon. It's... um. I thought I did. Let me yeah. try again, everybody. I apologise. Share screen. That's right. And then press on the... I'm sorry. Um, That's fine. It's all share good. Share screen. Gone. Down the bottom. I've got it. Yep. Share screen. And done. Then, yeah, beautiful. Well done. That's better. Sorry, everyone. Try again. Here we go. From the beginning, hello again. <laughs> I'm talking to you about the white-bellied sea eagles. If you're um, travelling up the river on a ferry or a river cat, you may see the eagles sitting high on the mangrove trees on the Ermington side of the river. You may be lucky enough to see one of the adults feeding on its prey on the mangrove um, branches. Um, another view, looking across the river um, to Ermington, there's a little island where they frequently sit and the river just in front. Passing river boats and so on don't seem to worry the birds. Um, they're pretty much used to that. But their nest is deep in the nature reserve forest, which is a threatened community of Sydney turpentine, ironbark um, forest trees. And it's there that they can nest undisturbed. The nest is huge, some two metres across and at least a metre deep. Um, the birds um, make this nest 
Magia, and they're just at the almost at the end of their breeding cycle at the moment. Here shows you the ironbark tree. Nest right at the top, at least 20 metres up. We can only access the nest by um, climbing on a rope um, and our cameras are attached to this tree. Um, not only there's one camera looking down on the nest, another in a tree adjacent, and you can see a climber there valiantly attaching the lights and the cameras to the tree. And we can even watch by day and night as we have um, infrared cameras. Um, we, we pretty know from observing from 10 years that our lights or our cameras don't disturb their breeding cycle, um, which is a good thing to know. White-bellied sea eagle, magnificent birds with some two metre wingspan. The female is larger than the male, and being a big female, I quite accept that. Um, beautiful birds, mainly grey and white, touches of black, white underneath, as their name might indicate. Sea eagles are raptors, as are wedge-tailed eagles. The little kestrel in the bottom right-hand corner, the smallest raptor. Black-shouldered kite, both seen around the Parramatta River. And you could consider owls as um, raptors as well because they all catch their prey with their feet using the sharp talons. Very typically, um, this in flight, a uh, white-bellied sea eagle with wings upswept, showing its black wingtips, um, white underbelly, and just showing a wedge-tailed eagle almost equal in size. So a huge bird, two metre wingspan, as I said, just magnificent. So all raptors catch their prey, with their talons. Here's the sea eagle with its talons, its feet outstretched. Terrific eyesight, hence the expression eagle eye, heading for prey in the water. And this is a picture of our just recently fledged young bird on the nest this year, showing those sharp, needle sharp talons and their feet rough underneath. If you catch slippery fish, it's good to have sandpaper feet. So, Eagle CAM, as we call it, is a bird life project um, working in partnership with national parks and Sydney Olympic Park Authority. We need our um, research agreement with these, these groups. And our objective is to observe and learn about their biology without interfering in their behaviour. So they're wild birds, we're privileged to watch them. We don't intervene except in exceptional circumstances. They're listed as vulnerable in New South Wales now, um, probably because of loss of habitat, particularly breeding habitat and disturbance at the nest. Our nest, we're fortunate, is in a restricted area with no disturbance or minimal. What have we learned? We've learned that both parents bring sticks to build the nest and leaves to line it. They both incubate, not this different in some other species, only the female at night though. They exhibit delayed incubation. I'll describe a little more about that. For around 40 days, so they sit on those eggs in winter for 40 days, and they both, both bring prey to the nest, um, though the male is the male provider, main provider. But life is hard, particularly in the city. Even so, over the years, since just the year before we put the camera up, we've had 22 eggs laid and 10 of those have fledged. Fledging meaning when they took their, took their first flight, which is a breeding success of just under one each year. They are in trouble, as I said, it's a vulnerable species. And this is what we're aiming for. Two beautiful young fledglings just left the nest, ready to go out into the wide world. A history of the nest, I'll just go through briefly because it gives a little idea of um, some of the problems and the things that affect them on the nest. Um, we know there's been an historic nest, as we've called it, in the nature reserve, which was on Ranad, naval land, so protected from the public for many years, but we haven't seen young on the nest until 2003. Hooray, there was a young bird seen on the nest, not from our cameras, just from the ground, which fledged and left the area. But in 2004, which is the year our study started in um, earnest, there were birds nesting on the mangrove trees across the river, as I showed you. 
Um, we were expecting the eggs to hatch. We saw the female dead on the nest and we sadly found the male's body dead the next um, day or so. They were tested, but their bodies were tested. Um, not sure why they died exactly, but they showed high levels of persistent organic pesticides, chemical residues left in the river, which would be in their prey and in the, um, the fish and the birds that they eat. Many other things have happened over the years. Occasionally a young bird has just not hatched or been too cold, too wet. 2012, we had a big issue with fishing line. Two young birds on the nest ready to go almost. Um, we observed fishing line. We were able to take a cherry picker to this nest. This is a different nest. The poor bird had fishing line coming from its bill. Off to the vets where it had surgery, removed this huge fishing hook that it was sufficiently um, recovered to go back to the nest where they both recovered, um, kept getting fed by the adults, fledged and left the nest. We took the opportunity that year to ban both of those birds. Another year, neither egg hatched. They were examined again at the animal hospital. Um, one was infertile, one just wasn't, um, just failed to hatch, not 100% sure why. But again, high levels of the persistent organic pesticides, just showing that how in the food chain, these pesticides build up in the birds' bodies or their eggs. Another year, France. What's this? It's a protozoan parasite which causes um, lesions to grow. Connection with a T Rex. This is a T Rex called Sue in a museum in America, some 68 million years old. And Sue also exhibited signs of France, little lesions in her bones, a very persistent virus. Uh, another year, one bird fledged and left the nest, but the second bird, he branched, meaning he jumped up and down to the nest, but he never actually flew. We could tell there was something wrong with its feathers um, by looking at the camera and also feathers we collected later from the ground. We tried to fly, it fell. We intervened at this stage with approval, took it to Taronga Wildlife Hospital, where it was examined and discovered to be suffering from beak and feather disease, circa virus. Um, it was kept there for a short time, but it, when its beak became deformed, it was euthanized. This is probably spread by parrots, cockatoos, possibly in their nest. So the birds they eat cause problems. The frowns sea I talked about previously is probably spread by pigeons. 2016, our old lady, our old female disappeared and a new girl turned up, accepted by the male. So they're probably birds, though we only see one pair on the river at the moment. There are probably pairs around looking for a place to um, a territory and a mate. New nest, two eggs, two, one um, young bird, looking pretty good, but fell, landed on the ground. Um, Checked it out at the hospital again, just in case it had beak and feather disease. It was pronounced clean. Um, put it back on the old nest. Silly thing jumped down again. But good news was that it did fledge and left the area. Another issue, um, an intruder at the nest. Two eggs, one little chick just hatched, one day old. Something happened and the parents did not attend the nest all day. So it's June, cold. We found a bird in the evening, an injured bird. We weren't sure if it was one of our parents or a different bird. It turned out to be a young female looking for territory. She unfortunately had been killed. And the little chick, of course, had died because it was cold. Female removed it. Interestingly, the male continued to sit on that egg for a long time until he eventually gave up and left the nest as well. So one little egg left abandoned. Another year, an example of another problem with the eagles is sibling rivalry. The chicks will um, hatch a couple of days apart. So one will always be bigger than the second. And in this year, a bit of sibling rivalry to start with, but then something happened and the male brought no food at all to the nest. So the rivalry kicked in again. 
the bigger chick peck, peck, pecking at the smaller, picked all the feathers off its head, didn't actually kill it, but it caused it to die by just out-competing it and ate all the food. So basically it died from starvation. Female removed its body from the nest, but fortunately the surviving, the fittest, it survived and fledged and left. But he branched. Then, unfortunately, he fell. But maybe with assistance from some friends from Feathered Friends, was taken into care, looked after for some time at Feathered Friends, then to the Higher Grounds Raptor Centre, where she received magnificent care, beautiful bird, brought back in a, in a humiliating box, released in its natal territory, and off she went. A good story. And even better, we've seen it a few years later, up in um, Bobman Head in, in um, Broken Bay. We can tell which bird it is by the missing wing feathers. 2019, working again on the nest, so both bringing in sticks, two eggs, two chicks. The younger eaglet fledged first, was knocked to the ground by a swooping magpie where a circling fox freaked us out, something awful. Someone was able to um, climb the fence, chase the fox away, and that bird actually fledged and flew. But the second bird, it branched, we pledged, we found it in the forest several times, but for some reason it failed to thrive and we found it dead. It may not have been fed by the parents, we're really not quite sure. This year, going fairly quickly, I'm conscious of time, building up the nest, lining it with green leaves, two eggs laid, middle of June, midwinter, it's cold. Little egg, just the second egg, just pipping. The little chick inside is stimulated by the other chick, picking out by itself. And we again showed delayed incubation. So the parents, because the eggs are laid a couple of days apart, the first egg, she doesn't sit on it completely at all. Even at night, it was left uncovered for 12, 11 hours when it's cold. This causes the second egg a chance, or the second chick, I should say, a chance to catch up. So the eggs this, this year laid 82 hours apart, hatched 45 hours apart. So the second chick has a little bit of a chance to catch up. So there's the little chick, first chick just hatched. Two little chicks doing quite well. A little bit of sibling rivalry but not, nothing serious. The parents feed them beak to beak, little pieces of fish. You can see the fish there on the nest. Tiny morsels getting bigger. You can see a difference in size. Little bit of sibling rivalry. The second chick is just cowering while the first one is fed. They, in fact, caught up. They're the two of them. You can see a difference in size. Little feathers just starting to grow. Being fed a gull chick here. Flapping wings, getting stronger, exercising, new brown feathers starting to come through. Um, here they both are with their brown feathers um, self-feeding. Um, parents bring the food. So even though they can snatch the food and learn to feed themselves, they're still being fed. The current chick's still being fed on the nest. Flapping those wings, getting stronger. So the older chick branched. At 74 days, took his first flight. Then he left the nest perhaps too soon, a few days later. It was seen by a member of the public landing clumsily on the ground. We watched it carefully on the ground for a bit. It's been seen a few times, but we're really unsure where it is at the moment. Hopefully being fed by the parents, but we don't know. Um, the second chick has always had a problem with its leg, its right leg. We're not sure if it's something from birth or an injury. It's still able to flap its wings, jump up and down, but you can see favouring that right leg. It can stand. Um, it's relentlessly swooped on the nest by a pair of currawongs, which are probably nesting nearby, protecting their own. Everybody hates the eagles. 
just um, the other day it's branched, so it's sitting up there, it's managing to cling to that branch. This is just this morning, the adults have brought in prey and the bird is able to fly from the branch to the nest where it's self-feeding. So this is hot off the press this morning, but we're really not quite sure. I'll just go briefly through the sort of things that the eagles eat. They specialise in fish and silver gulls here on Parramatta River. Pirating means in nicking food from other species in the river. They probably scavenge and get dead stuff. Main problem coming from their prey. So lots of fish, I'll just zoom through. Mullet, brim, whiting, lots of little birds. Pigeon, mm, a worry with the France problem. Seagulls, eels, little gulls. They've brought in lots of um, nestling gulls this year. Um, garfish, turtle, hard to open. And this, <laughs> the other day, most surprisingly, a young fox cub, most unusual. So what can we do to help these beautiful birds to prey? We're keeping the river clean, our Parramatta River Action Group, we're trying to re reduce rubbish, um, looking after fishing lines we need to, um, by watching and learning, we're learning as much as we can and helping in there um, to protect the species. And we know they are safe and undisturbed in the forest nest. Thank all these wonderful people who've helped keep the cameras going, moderators, people watch all day and night, keep our notes. And this is what it's all about. Two little fat, healthy chicks with full crops, just had a great big feed. A bit of a montage of pictures of these chicks all over in the nest. What's the future for 25 and 26? I'm not quite sure. 25's out there somewhere. 26, will it be able to survive as a raptor? Um, and this is what it's all. We hope we will see them flying free and wild. And I always like to say, remember from the book, The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf the Wizard, talking to his friends, the eagle says, may the wind under your walls. Thank you all. Maybe some questions. Thank you very much, Judy. So I, I'm over to you, Nell, for questions. Yep, so far we have one question. Um, I think you may have answered this, but it may have not um, come through because you did cut out a little bit. Do you think the remaining fledging will survive with the issue it has on its leg, with its leg? That's a very hard question, Nell. Um, it certainly is compromised with a weak leg, um, which will possibly give it um, difficulty in landing, in perching, and more important, in catching its prey. It has improved mightily. It is certainly able to go to the branch and it's able to flap back in. It has improved in strength. We do not have permission to go to the nest to intervene at this stage and rescue it, but if it should fledge, try to fly and fall to the ground. We do have permission to um, retrieve it straight away. We would take it to Taronga Wildlife Hospital for assessment, x-ray, possibly some surgery, possibly something could be done to improve its leg strength. It may, um, it would then go to rehabilitation and an ideal situation would it be, it would be released um, as a, um, wild free living bird it could if possibly be kept as an education bird or if its prognosis was really severe it could be euthanized we're only watching we can see and hope it, yeah. hope it improves do you ever want to intervene when you see um one of the fledgings in distress um it is, yes, it is very difficult and particularly a lot of our followers who don't understand do want us to intervene constantly. Poor little baby, why don't you rescue it? But they are wild birds. Um, our research licence does not permit intervention, except as you've seen over some of my examples um, from the past, exceptional circumstances we have. Um, we have intervened with permission. But for the moment, we need to leave them. They're wild birds. Things happen. This is what happens in the wild. Um, this, the 
the strongest um, individuals are the ones that survive. Yeah. Then the other bird, we don't know if its parents are feeding it, so we can only watch and and, um, and hope. Okay. Um, how is big is there? It, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, I just did that. I just wanted to follow up that because you said it it left the nest a bit early, um, at seventy five days. So when would they typically leave, and and why are you worried about the parents feeding it? I'm slightly distracted. There's a beautiful lyrebird walking past my window outside. <laughs> <laughs> no lyrebirds on the Parramatta River. Oh. Um, yes, you would expect it fledges. You know, it takes a flight. It would come back to the nest. It would come back to the nest as the birds we've observed in past years. They would come back to be fed. They gradually learn to rip their prey apart, um, possibly even go down to the river as they have in past years. This one just seems to have left home too early. It may be injured. Mm. It may have something wrong that we're not unfamiliar with. It might be out there wild and free, but my, I must admit I'm a little bit worried and it would be real a real relief to see it come back to the nest again, which is what we were expecting. Okay. So how big is their hunting territory? Um, that's hard to say. Um, we know that they do go to, um, they have been seen they'll fly as far as Goat Island. I was wondering if they were picking up um, gull nestlings from Cockatoo Island where they're nesting all over the ground. But I believe they get their prey from Homebush Bay. But we, um, they do fly a fair distance. But I believe this is the only pair nesting on the Parramatta River. So there's a fair bit of food nearby um, and in the Sydney Impey Park wetlands um, and gulls are nesting on the old boats in Homebush Bay, uh, sort of a smorgasbord of gulls, I hate to say. <laughs> so, but in other places they, they could have a territory of some kilometres. But when the young do fledge, they will disperse. They'll be chased off. They need to find their own territory. Do the pairs of eagles stay for more than one season or is it different ones each year? No, they do. They stay in their same territory, so they'll defend that territory, which as we saw the other year when a young female came in. Territory is precious, um, particularly undisturbed territory. They are faithful to their partner unless something happens. So all the years we've been watching the very first female we saw, um, her her male disappeared. A young young male, a juvenile, um, turned up, stayed with her for a bit, then he was chased off by this current male. That first female disappeared. So we've only seen two females and really um, two males in all that time. So they are faithful and they defend the territory rigorously. Mm. I noticed that you call the fledglings the SE and a number. But do yes. you ever give them a name? We don't. Many other nests do. And we've had, um, um, you know, why don't you have a competition? Children name them and so on. It personalises a, a little bit too much. People do call the, la the female is lady and the male is dad. <laughs> the original female was mum. Um, but we do, we, we do just um, give them a number. Yeah. Mm. You can get too involved. <laughs> Yeah, too heart-wrenching. <laughs> Are the eaglets um, um, ever blown out of the nest in high winds? Funny enough, they well, they haven't been. We've actually seen the feet, the, the parents flipped over by high winds and literally just flipped them over. That's an adult bird. Well, when the chicks are small, the nest bowl is cupped. It's quite deep. It's cupped. It's a deep bowl. So the chicks are protected well down in the bowl. As they grow larger, um, more and more sticks come. So at this stage, like now, it's almost a flat platform. It's still somewhat cupped. Um, so the chicks haven't been blown out, but they have, um, as the currawongs are swooping just now, not so much pushed by um, swooping birds, but make them freak out a bit, I suppose, on the edge of the nest and they've stumbled and fall, fallen, I mean, yeah. There's no other big predators here. There's no other big raptors. There is a little booble owl we see at night. We can hear it on the camera and we see which swoops, but much smaller than the sea eagles. So really of no, no um, problem. 
in other oh. areas where there's sea eagles, there may be other raptors or goannas or other creatures that could be a threat. There, I thought there was a powerful owl um, pair across in over in Ride. There could be. We have recorded a powerful owl in the forest um, once, um, possibly around at other times, but there's not a nesting pair close by. So the owls in the other territory compete. probably stick to their side of the river. Not a problem. Mm. I don't know if you said this during your um, presentation, but um, like how much does an adult eagle weigh? Oh, not, not much at all. Being, of course, have to be fairly light so it can fly. I think about three and a half, maybe up to four kilograms. So not a lot, much lighter. Oh, okay. that, that, that huge wingspan, huge wingspan. And that nest is must may weigh far, 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 far more than the, than the eagles, of course. A huge nest with massive number of sticks. Mm. Our very first nest, we put a camera on. The whole branch that the nest was on fell down. Fortunately, when the birds had left, and they, um, you know, the, the pile of sticks on the ground was just incredible. Mm. Yeah. Would be really interesting. Um, do you think that the parents will continue feeding for as long as it takes for... SE 26 is, to fledge? That is really interesting. I expect it will fledge moderately soon. Um, even when they fledge, the parents do bring food back to the nest, which is how the young birds, um, even for months, um, we will we'll keep watching. We're really interested to see. Um, if by any remote chance they stop feeding it and it hasn't flown, we would request permission to intervene, which involves getting a tree climber. And we don't do that lightly because we don't have permission to disturb the nest or the young on the nest. But at this stage, hopefully, well, we can only watch and see. Someone's also so asked. How long? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. There's just lots of questions coming in. So um, someone's asked, is there less chance for the eagle to get uh, flounce from the silver gulls? I don't believe it is spread by gulls. I have not heard that. It could possibly. Mostly it is a problem with pigeons, but like beak and feather disease, it is crossing species being found in, for example, powerful owl and other um, birds as, as, um, as well as parrots, which it originally started with. Um, so we're just a little bit suspicious when we see um, a little bit worried when we see them eating pigeons, but I mm. don't believe it has been spread by the gulls, but they do possibly have high levels of the persistent organic pesticides, though it hasn't been shown to kill the birds, but surely it contributes in some way to weakness or their general health. Um, someone also has asked, I think you may have answered this, are you aware of other nests in the area? And what is the, the population? No, the, of, of I'm not sure of the complete population. This is the only nest on the Parramatta River. There are a few other nests in bays and um, around Sydney, um, and particularly on the north coast or um, Lake Macquarie and so on, there are more nests there. But I, I don't imagine they were ever a really numerous species. Um, but this is the only pair on the Parramatta River. Mm. Okay. And um, how many eggs do they lay on, on average? We have two eggs. We've, we've only ever seen two eggs, and that's reported in the literature, two eggs. Um, you know, both may hatch, sometimes not. Both chicks may survive, sometimes not, as we've shown from the history of our nest. Mm. Just checking we've got all the questions but there's one last question I thought I'd leave it to the last unless someone's got another question yep. but someone's asked Judy what is your favorite bird <laughs> <laughs> well I'm a bit biased I do like sea eagles but I must admit that that like that live bird that just ran past you was pretty nice too that's that's my favorite bird at home and my favorite word bird at Sydney Olympic Park where I used to work and live nearby um, I'll say the sea eagle. And what else can I say? Uh -huh. um, one thing I didn't I didn't have a chance to play before was what they sound like because down on the river you might hear them. I'm just holding my tablet. I'll just play the call. You should be able to hear it because they got. So <laughs> okay. 
catch that? And that's the pair of eagles. Um, when they're, they're courting and even all through their nesting, they'll have a morning duet. The females um, got the lower call and male, male the higher tone. And the young bird on the nest at the moment, if you happen to look at it, it sure knows how to yell at those sweeping currawongs and tell them to get lost. <laughs> Um, someone here, has, it's Marie, she's just left a comment saying, I feel very fortunate to be able to watch this Sea Eagle family. Thank you all so much for giving us this opportunity and thank you also for the very sensible and respectful chat associated with the cameras. <laughs> you all do thank a great you. job. So that's from Marie. And thank I you, believe... Marie that's all the questions we've had today. So that's great. I just uh, ask, uh, when pe uh, uh, the, the eagle will fledge soon and the parents will go somewhere else. Is that correct? No, nope. nope. they'll hang around. They'll still hang around there. It's the young one who has to go. They may hang around together, maybe even January, February, if it survives. Um, but then the young one will be scooted off. It'll seek a new territory when it's even meets even more issues and problems and dangers. But the parents, this is their territory. They'll hang about down on the river and they'll start getting frisky again, frisky again, sort of April, May, and start nesting next year in winter. Okay. Well, we look forward have, to next year's as well. I just have uh, one more question, one of my personal <laughs> ones. <laughs> Yes. Um, how do you track a branded bird? Like I saw you had a little, um, you know, ring yeah. around its leg. But so how do you keep track of them? I, ideally, when we had the birds in the hand then, that, the two birds that year that had the bands, um, you really only can track them. You can see them um, from the telescope and so on once they're fledged or if you would be unfortunate enough to find a dead one you would you would know where it came from the work the way people do track them and we would love to be able to do this is to put a little satellite tracker on them um mm. the godwits that we've with our other river mascot um they know the flight of the godwits by putting a light very light satellite tracker and they can track their journey around the world when we had the bird with the injured wing um a few years ago mm. we would we requested permission to put a satellite tracker and band it but um that we, we weren't given permission that year. And ideally, that's the only way we know. We've the one that had um, had gaps in its wing. We did recognise it because that distinctive wing pattern, because that feather, the damage that feather would never be replaced. Well, we assume that's what it is. It would be lovely to track them. That's the only way. <laughs> so why why were you not given permission? To um, just caution with the treatment of the bird, the rehabilitator was recommended to national parks that we couldn't um, uh, handle the bird and, and uh, subject it to more stress. Because it's a vulnerable species, you require that extra permission. Oh, I see. I, I must admit, I presented a paper in the um, ornithological conference in Darwin, and all the raptor people said, why on earth didn't you band it and put a tracker on it? But yeah. it's not that simple. No, of course. Um, would it be worthwhile to uh, have a, like a tracking program um, for the fledglings to see where how it, far they range? It would be most interesting. And I know they travel from other birds that have been branded and not branded, um, tracked in other states. They travel huge different distances, even interstate. I guess people have, have studied the, the sea eagles because in Tasmania and South Australia, they're in fact in much more trouble than they are here, even a threatened species there. Oh, okay. Mm. Well, I guess I might hand over to Jasmine to wrap up, but thank you, Judy. It was very interesting. I've learnt a lot. Uh, thank you, Nell, and thank you, Judy, for this presentation. Uh, we suggest that people might like to volunteer at BirdLife. Uh, the uh, offices are at uh, um, the Sydney Olympic Park and you can find them on the website. Do you want to say anything about that, Judy? 
Oh, that'd be wonderful. Yes, we have a discovery centre. We've been closed, of course, for months. But we've just opened on Sundays at the moment. We get members of the public come in, particularly when the, um, the eagles are active. Um, people come in and look closer at good screens we have there. We do programs with children. You know, I've been... Um, I like to talk to the children about the eagles and our birds, but volunteers, always welcome. We've got okay. an awful lot of eagle cam data that needs crunching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And there's a few more events at Riverfest on Saturday. So have a look at our ourlivingriver.com.au uh, forward slash Riverfest to check it out. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. All right. Thank you, everyone. Lovely to talk. Lots of thank yous coming in on the chat. So thank you, everyone. See that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye then. Bye.